the numbers are starting to level out. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and if anyone joins uh, later, hopefully you'll uh, jump right in with us. My name is Audrey Savage, and I am an International Communications Officer here at Lund University. I'm going to be moderating our session today about practical experience opportunities. So today we're going to talk a lot about all of the different opportunities you have at Lund, both inside and outside the classroom, in order to expand your horizons, uh, gain some experience for your CV, and hopefully uh, help uh, get you a really good career after you graduate so that you can go on to do more amazing things after your time at Lund. So today we're going to start first with a brief presentation that I'm going to share that goes through just some of these different opportunities and some things to think about as you consider uh, coming to Lund uh, and consider doing some things such as uh, part-time jobs, internships, research, uh, what you might consider after your studies, things like that. Uh, but we're going to spend the majority of our time here today with our current students. So we have a fantastic panel today of six different current students who have joined us who are going to share about the experiences they're currently involved in or have been involved in during their time with Lind uh, in order to expand their experiences during their studies. So we will focus the majority of our time on that panel and on answering questions related to their experiences. I have a staff member, Tim, who is with us in the background today. You can't see him, but he'll be helping us answer some questions in the Q&A as well. Uh, so throughout the presentation, if you have any questions or specifically if you have questions for our panelists later, once we introduce them, feel free to post those in the Q&A and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. You can also upvote questions in the Q&A. So if you see that someone has already posted the same question that you have, you can give it a little thumbs up or an upvote and that will shoot it up higher in the list to make sure that we kind of see that and know that a lot of people have that question in order to ask it. So I can see we have a few people who've already raised their hand. So if you wanna go ahead and post your question in the Q&A, please feel free to do so. But again, remember that we're going to be focusing mainly on questions today for our panelists. And if you have other questions related to the application process, process, scholarships, or anything else, uh, please contact our office at the link that I've just put in the chat for you. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with our presentation so that then we can sooner get to our panelists, our main show of the day. So hopefully everyone uh, can see my presentation. So again, today we're going to talk about a lot of the different ways that you can really expand your opportunities while you're at Lund and gain more experience, both for your potential future career, also just for your personal experience and to enjoy your time here at Lund. So of course, one of the first things that we often get asked at Lund is about working while studying, having part-time jobs during your studies uh, in order to either gain experience or also for uh, some funding. So of course, the first thing that we always like to say about working is that you are eligible to work, but there's a few things that you need to keep in mind when considering doing work while studying. So uh, first, if you're coming to Lund as a non-EU student, you will be required to have the funds to cover your studies before arriving to Sweden uh, as part of your residence permit process. This is something that you don't have to worry too much about right now. We're going to talk about it a lot more later after admission decisions come out for those of you who get admitted. But it is something to keep in mind that you do have to have the funds prepared before you come to Sweden. It's not going to be possible to work during your studies in order to cover your funds while you're here. As an EU student, there is no uh, funding requirement, but it is important to just kind of start thinking about at this point uh, how you will be able to support yourself during your studies again uh, and not be too dependent on finding a job while you're here. Uh, we always suggest that any income from a part-time job is something that can be a nice bonus, maybe providing a little bit of extra pocket money for your daily expenses, but it's really not realistic to think that a part-time job will be something that will cover all of your living costs especially because when you're at Lund, you're of course here to study. So studying is your number one priority. You might be expected to study anywhere upwards to 40 hours a week, just like a normal full-time job. So you should consider studying as a full-time job and that any additional opportunities you do on the side will kind of be a bonus to that. So also at Lund, we have uh, 40,000 students in what is pretty much a small town. So it can be also very competitive to find part-time jobs as we have a lot more students, of course, who would like jobs than we have jobs available. 
It's also important to note that most jobs uh, may require knowing Swedish. There are always, of course, exceptions to this, and you will get to hear today from several students who do have part-time jobs. Uh, so, of course, this is a possibility, but knowing Swedish is always a benefit. So sometimes uh, it can be difficult for international students because you're a little bit a step behind the Swedish students who are also looking for a job in your job hunt. And the university, unfortunately, also doesn't regularly employ students the way that they do in a lot of countries, so there aren't a lot of jobs available through the university. So the main thing uh, with regarding working while studying, it can be a really good way to gain experience, but it also should be looked at realistically in terms of uh, seen as kind of a bonus. If you are able to find a part-time job, that's fantastic. You can learn a lot of things from it and perhaps get a little bit of extra pocket money, but it's never something that you should rely on as a guarantee that when you come to Lund, you're going to find a job because that can be unrealistic. However, a lot of what we're going to talk about today are some of the other opportunities that you can use to gain part-time experience while you're studying. So, of course, having a job is one great way to gain experience, but there's also so many other options uh, that are available to you. So first, we can talk about internships. So of course, uh, most everyone in the world knows what an internship is and that it's a really great way to gain experience in your uh, field of interest. But it can also be a really good way to kind of test out Sweden and Swedish business culture. If you're interested potentially in staying in Sweden to work after your graduation, it can be a good way to kind of start to get an idea what it's like uh, as far as the work culture in Sweden, which can be very different from a lot of other countries. It's also a great way to start building your network in Sweden, because, of course, if you do an internship with local companies or organizations, you're already building a network and making those connections that can be useful for you after graduation. One thing that's uh, very helpful is that a lot of our programs actually offer the possibility or even require an internship as part of the program. So depending on which program you're studying, you might find that it's actually built into your program for you to do an internship as part of the program, which can be really helpful. And then in other programs, there's sometimes an option to select an internship instead of taking an elective course. So for example, if you're studying a program that has a built-in uh, semester or part of a semester that has an elective option, there's usually an option to either take a specific course if you want to, to kind of choose a different elective course that's not necessarily the specific courses that are outlined in your program or to do an internship. So you can often choose to do this as well. We also have our own career portal here at Lund called My Career, where different organizations can reach out to us and say that they're specifically interested in hiring Lund University students or graduates and want to advertise their internships and their jobs through us. So that can be a really good way to put you in touch with some of these internships to know that those opportunities are out there. And even if you're studying a program that a internship is not necessarily part of your program as far as a requirement, there's often still an opportunity for you to do an internship either on the side or especially during the summer or in between in the breaks during the year. So that can also be something to consider if it's something you're interested in. Next, we can talk a little bit about research. So of course, Many different faculties and departments have options for students to participate in research, both as part of the program and also potentially outside of the program. Uh, so this can be something that can also really expand what you're learning in the classroom in order to be able to use that knowledge in a hands-on way to produce really valuable research. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, highlight here, though it's by no means the only opportunity to do research at Lund, but a specific one here is the Faculty of Medicine, who offers a summer research scholarship, which will actually fund doing two months of research during the summer if you're part of the Faculty of Medicine. And we have a student here today, Samu, who took advantage of this opportunity, so you'll be able to hear more in the panel about uh, this specific opportunity and about her research. But it's really important when you uh, first arrive, you can talk to your program coordinator, or your professors to see what opportunities might be available within your department in terms of doing research, or what opportunities are already built into your program that you'll be able to do research and start to have a think about how you can kind of uh, tailor that research to your specific interests in order to help you potentially further along in your career. Another opportunity that a lot of people often don't think about when they come to Lund is studying abroad. So of course, most of you today probably listening to this presentation are most likely international students. So coming to Lund would mean that you're already studying abroad, but you can study abroad within a study abroad, a little bit of an inception situation there. So we have over 500 different partner universities at Lund that we work with to offer different exchange semesters 
or mobility programs uh, throughout Lund. So quite often these are sometimes uh, specific to the program. So there might be uh, specific exchanges that are open within your program because that partner university is specialized in offering the classes related to your program. Uh, but it's always worth looking into if this is an option for you. Also, a lot of programs that do require internships or work placements will often allow you to do those anywhere in the world. So if you want to go back to your home country or go to a new country in order to complete your internship or even to complete some research, uh, collect some data, that's usually very encouraged at Lund. So you can use that opportunity as well to go abroad and get some more experience. I'd also like to highlight, in addition to, of course, uh, many of our programs that do exchange semesters, several of our business programs in particular offer something called an international master class semester, which is essentially after your degree is finished, you can apply to do an additional semester at a partner university uh, in another country and basically complete an additional semester of classes and projects that are designed basically to solidify some of the knowledge that you've learned within your degree. And some of them also offer double degree options. So if you do an additional semester somewhere, you can essentially graduate with a double degree from two universities, which can be a really great complement to your CV and your experience. But essentially, overall, studying abroad is a really great way to continue to expand your perspectives while at Lund and add to your CV even more. The more international experience we have in today's global world, the better. So it can be a really great way to highlight your experiences. Of course, another thing that students often know is going to happen as part of their studies, but don't think as much about as a potential opportunity to expand their career vision is through your degree project. So the majority of our programs do require that you write a thesis or complete some form of degree project at the end of your studies. And this can be a really great way to either network and collaborate with a company or expand your area of interest in terms of your career. So a lot of students uh, collaborate with companies in order to do research that is specifically related to the field that the company works in, perhaps uh, about research that the company is interested in having, which can be a great way to sort of start that network and get insights into the work environment of that company. Um, one example I'd like to share here for is uh, that is one of, of course, very many, uh, but we have in Lund a very famous company called Tetra Pak, which if anyone has ever used a milk carton that is essentially a uh, cardboard container with sort of plasticky inside so that you can hold liquids inside a cardboard container, then you've used a Tetra Pak product. As you can imagine, there's many, many of those out there, cardboard containers that contain liquid foods. Uh, so Tetra Pak pioneered that. And for example, our program in food technology and nutrition quite often has students who will complete their degree project with Tetra Pak in order to do some research that Tetra Pak's interested in. And oftentimes that can lead to potentially an internship or a job at Tetra Pak after working. So of course, that's just one example of one company, but there are many, many others that you can use to expand your degree projects. And often quite a few of these will even uh, pay students for this research during your part-time work. Or even if you don't do your degree study with a company, you can always still try and tailor the topic of your degree to be something that is in a field that you're interested in studying or in working in afterwards in order to kind of get your foot in the door and use that in your future career search. And finally, of course, there are countless, countless opportunities to volunteer at Lund University, which can be a really good way to build your network, to meet a lot of other students and also professionals uh, in order to kind of have a steady network after graduation and just meet a lot of really interesting people to gain different perspectives. Uh, there are many opportunities to do this. You can, of course, sign up to be a mentor or sign up to work with different local departments or NGOs. There are numerous different student organizations, student unions, the nations, uh, which if you aren't already aware during our student life month this month, uh, that we have a lot of information about the unions, nations, and organizations. So if you're more curious about that, we'll share some info too at the end about how you can learn more about those opportunities this month. But really volunteering can be a great way to make those new connections, add to your CV, and really enjoy your time here at Lind at the same time. So of course, a lot of these practical experience opportunities are ways for you to expand your CV, expand your experiences in order to help you finding future work after your studies. So while this isn't the main topic of our uh, presentation here today, I wanna briefly talk about some of the ways uh, that this can help you in finding work after your studies. So of course, 
Uh, just in general, a degree from Lund is really valuable uh, out there in the world. It, Lund is a top 100 university after all, so it's something that can be highly valued by different employees. And there's a lot of different opportunities, as we've already talked about today, and as we'll hear more about from our panelists later, that you can kind of blend these different opportunities into building a network, into expanding your experiences and your skills that will help you in a job search, no matter where you look for a job. We do recommend, of course, that students expand their job search as much as possible. So while there are a lot of jobs available in Lund and in Sweden, it's always advisable to look globally, look in your home country and other countries as there's a lot of different careers out there that you never really knew existed even potentially that can be great opportunities for you. And one thing that a lot of students don't think about is looking at Swedish companies that are operating abroad or operating in your home country, because, of course, that's an opportunity that potentially you could make a connection with a Swedish company through an internship or through volunteering while you're here in Sweden that could lead for you to having a job back in your home country through the same company. So that can also be a great way to make connections here in Sweden. If you do prefer to stay and work in Sweden, it's always important to remember to start that job search as early as possible and use a lot of these opportunities that we're talking about today in order to build that network within Sweden to kind of explore those job opportunities. It is always advisable to learn a little bit of Swedish if you're planning to stay in Sweden. Of course, there are a lot of companies that operate totally in English, so there are opportunities out there uh, if you don't learn Swedish. But of course, as with any country in the world, you always really open a lot more opportunities for yourself if you learn Swedish or at least a little bit of Swedish while you're here. And in terms of staying to look for work in Sweden, just to touch on this briefly, even though there's a lot more information about this that you would learn about if you're admitted longer down the line uh, of studying at Lund. But EU students, of course, are allowed to move freely within Sweden to stay and look for work. And if you're a non-EU student, there is an after studies permit that you can apply for once you've graduated, which will allow you to stay in Sweden for 12 months and look for work as long as you can fund yourself during that 12 months. So that's the important part. But that would allow you, if you do find a work, to basically start working immediately while you apply for your work permit, instead of having to go back home and apply from your home country, which is what normally happens. But again, this I don't want to get in too much in depth because there's a lot more information further down the line in your study experience about this. You don't have to worry too much about it right now. But one thing that is really useful to know is that within our immediate environment here in the what's called the greater Copenhagen region, there are a lot of different opportunities for work, again, both after your studies and during your studies in terms of part time jobs, internships. We have another student today on the panel who is doing some volunteer work within Copenhagen. So we're really placed in an excellent location here for you to expand your opportunities while at Lund. We're only 10 to 15 minutes away by train from Malmö, which is Sweden's third largest city, and about 45 minutes away from Copenhagen, which is of course Denmark's capital. So within this whole area, we have a huge number of different companies uh, and organizations. As you can see here, also 14,000 researchers, almost 200,000 students, numerous research parks and startup hubs and different higher education institutions. So there is a huge amount of opportunity packed into a reasonably small space here around Lund. Another thing that we often get a lot of questions about is going on to do PhD studies, which of course having, if you are applying for a master's degree, a master's degree from Lund makes you eligible to continue PhD studies, at least here in Sweden and in most countries. One important thing to note, which again, I don't wanna to cover too heavily here, but just to mention is that when you apply for a PhD in Lund uh, or in Sweden in general, it is considered like a job. So you'll be paid through the department and you apply and are employed through the department that's conducting your research. So it's considered less like a program, like the way that you apply for a bachelor's or master's program and more like a job that you apply for. But applying for PhD studies can also be another thing to consider, especially if you're doing research during your time here at Lund it can be a great way to take the research that you've begun during your studies and continue that on to explore as a PhD. We also have a lot of students both during their studies or after their studies who are interested in starting their own business in Sweden or who have different business ideas. So there's a lot of support systems that I want to also touch on briefly that can help you with these services. So the first is Venture Lab, which is the startup hub that we have for Lund University students and recent graduates. So the nice thing about Venture Lab is it doesn't matter uh, what you study, what uh, category or field of study you're in, you don't necessarily need to be studying business, for example, and it doesn't matter if you're just starting out your studies in your first semester or if you've just recently graduated. 
The main thing is if you have a new idea for a service or a business, they're there to help you with free guidance, different lectures and events and workshops. And they even have a free office space that student businesses can use for up to a year if you're getting your business started. They also host a Lind Innovation Challenge, which is a three day uh, challenge where students are partnered together to develop new ideas and prototypes to solve different challenges in the world. And again, one of our students on our panelists here today works with Venture Lab, so we'll get to hear a little bit more about Venture Lab as well. So if you have questions about that, feel free to start posting those in the Q&A as well. Next is the Lund University Student Innovation Center, which is a link between the university and businesses. So the LU Innovation Center helps you make your business idea a reality by supporting students with those ideas and trying to figure out if you've done specific research, how you can convert that research into a business product or an idea. And these are also free of charge services for students and researchers at Lund. We also have the Sten K. Johnson Center for Entrepreneurship. So while there is a master's degree in entrepreneurship at Lund, you don't necessarily have to be studying the entrepreneurship masters to take courses within entrepreneurship at the Sten K. Johnson Center. So the courses are open for students from all different fields of study, both in Swedish or in English, that you can study potentially as part of your program or as freestanding courses if you'd like to learn a bit more about entrepreneurship and how that can help you in your career after your studies. And finally, we have a day on Science Park, which was founded in 1983 as the first science park within Sweden and in Northern Europe that connects different science and researchers with entrepreneurs and innovators within different businesses. So currently there are over 400 companies at Ideon. It's been over 1200 since the start of the Ideon Science Park that have all different kinds of specialties such as life science, sustainability and clean energy, food innovation, all different topics. And you might recognize a lot of them. We have a lot of very big companies working at Ideon such as Bosch, Sony, Ericsson, Volvo, uh, numerous other companies that all have their research and development offices here in Lund. So this can also be a great way to start making connections with some of those big companies in the terms of internships or research opportunities that are available with them. So the main point that we want to get across here today is to really take advantage of the opportunities you have here at Lund. They really are endless. So it's great to start thinking about it before you even come to Lund to make sure that you're ready to hit the ground running and start exploring those new career options, gaining skills for your CV and really just enjoying your time here at Lund while you're here. But that's enough chatting from me. I know we went through that rather quick, but I really want to get to our panel discussion as that's the main reason why we're here today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and jump over into our panel. So if our students will join me here, excellent. Great to see everybody. So one more, yes. And we have another panelist today who will potentially be joining us a little late. She gets out of her a meeting at 4.30, so she might jump in here later. But first, I'd like to go through and introduce everyone. So of course, we have some excellent uh, current students here with us today, ready to share about their experiences. So without further ado, I wanna jump in and have everyone go around, perhaps if you could share, um, of course, your name, where you're from, what you study, and what different experiences you're here to talk about today. So Adarsh, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, my name is Adash. I'm from India. Um, I study masters in linguistics. Um, I have lived in Sweden for about five and a half years. Uh, I have done uh, an internship in Prague for a magazine, um, and it was a journalism internship, and that was in 2017 during my bachelor's. Uh, in the last two years, I have worked with a company called AOS Cares, which is a uh, an NGO, a part of AOS, which is a basketball club in Lund, and they conduct programs for integration of refugees and asylum seekers. I work there, I, uh, I, I manage the language cafe uh, where, uh, you know, they come, beginners come to practice their Swedish, and there are also games and barbecues for kids, stuff like that. Uh, I presently work as a part-time teacher at an international school, and uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I teach years three, four, five, six. So that's about the age group eight to eight to 12. I, I also work in something called free teas, which is like the Swedish after school recreation, where you just take care of kids while, while their parents come and pick them up, uh, take them to the playground or the park and such. So yeah, those are the two roles that I currently have. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Adarsh. So already hitting the ground running with a lot of different things to be involved in and seeing a great example of a way how you can really use your time wisely to be involved in a lot of different things. Thank you. Samu, how about you next? Hi, everyone. I'm Samu. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm studying Masters in Public Health, and I have done research uh, and internships through the summer scholarships from the medical faculty. And I also work part-time as a babysitter. Um, so that's what I do. Wonderful, thanks. Dion? Hello, everyone. I'm Dion Boyutami. I come from Indonesia. I'm studying in Human Geography program, master. And I just finished my exchange study in University of Groningen, Netherlands. And currently I'm doing my master thesis, which is data collection in my home country. And it's part of a collaboration with companies in Indonesia and also it's get the funding from one university. That's all. Thank you. Great. So a great way to hear about different ways that you can combine exchange, but also going abroad to do research collection. So that's awesome. Hasni, how about you next? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hasni. I'm a Kurdish guy from Turkey. I'm studying culture and creativity management master program at campus Helsinki. Currently, I'm working like on five and six different tasks. Like being a, a student mentor, being a student ambassador is two of them. But today I want to mention uh, another two of them. The first one is a project that I take part in voluntarily as a project assistant. It's about exploring how artificial intelligence technology can impact and support the creative process from the point of view of a screenwriter. And the second one is a paid student job at university. I'm working as an event coordinator for Venture Lab. Like uh, Audrey said, it's an organization that tries to inspire students to let them explore entrepreneurship and innovation. They have coaching session, incubator, inspiration events. Even you don't have to have an idea. They help you to come up with an idea. So these are the main things that I do. Thank you. Great, thanks. And Judith. Hi, I'm Judith. I'm from Spain. I'm studying a master's in innovation and global sustainable development, which is part of the School of Economics and Management. Uh, I'm currently in Costa Rica doing field work. Um, it's also part of uh, my program um, to collect data for my uh, thesis. Wonderful. And thanks for joining us so early in the morning in Costa Rica time, Judith. Great. So I want to jump right in and take advantage of the time that we have. So perhaps first, if everyone could share a little bit about how you actually got started or how you learned about this opportunity and why you chose to take part in it. Uh, and for, I guess, multiple opportunities for some of you who have several things. So um, why don't we go the opposite way around then this time? And Judith, we'll start with you. Or well, actually, I think Judith might be frozen. So Hasni, we'll start with you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, none of them was recorded or were part of my study here. Uh, I can start with the paid job opportunity. Uh, since I came to Sweden, I tried to explore anything that I think it can contribute to, to me in a way. So during first semester, I participated in a new innovation challenge that was organized by the Venture Lab. And later on, it really inspired me and I continued to explore innovation and entrepreneurship field uh, in Skåne. At the beginning of this semester, I just saw an announcement that States Venture Lab was looking for an event coordinator as a student employee. So I just applied it and got it. I can answer if you have specific questions about the process. And my role in AI research is also linked to this chain. I started the Follow Mind Park, which is a co-working space in housing board and collaborate with Venture Lab also. Uh, and its MindSpark founder is also manager of Venture Lab in housing board. So you will find these chains of relations while you are networking. Uh, so on LinkedIn, I was also following MindSpark and I just saw that an AI project was uh, granted a fund uh, and the guy who runs it uh, was working in 
tell Zimboy. So I just emailed him and I said, I want to take part in this project. And if there's any way that I can be part of it, we had an interview and yeah, so he, we are working out together. Wow, that's so great to hear. Thank you, Hasni. I think that's a really great example of how often students can think it's very complicated to find these opportunities. But a lot of times, uh, if you really just reach out to those who are around you and kind of pay attention to the things that people are advertising, but also just ask questions about things you'd like to be involved in, that's a really great way to find those options that are out there. Wonderful. Thanks. Dion, how about you? How did you get interested in doing your exchange studies and in your research? Okay, well, uh, so. In my program, in the third semester, we have the three option with this inter internship, elective course or exchange studies. And then I'm start to looking the opportunity for exchange studies. And I found the website provided by Lund University and also the SolMove uh, website. It's about the exchange mo study mobility around uh, the club and you can find a lot of program and study option that's uh, in collaboration with your program. And uh, for me, it's uh, there are a lot of human geography program out there. And I, and I decided to uh, choose University of Groningen because it meets my interest in some of the courses. And then I'm start to find information how it's how to apply and what is the requirement for this exchange study uh, and then I just uh, follow the instruction and the timeline provided by Lund University and then yeah I got the exchange study and for the data collection I also so Lund University, especially in my social science faculty, they will give us the email related to information about uh, international opportunities, uh, usually around October for the autumn term and around uh, January for the spring term. There's a lot of uh, opportunity, opportunities and one of them, the data collection opportunities and then start looking at that and uh it's basically we can find by ourselves uh the companies that want to collaborate with us and then we can apply the funding from the Lund university great thanks so much for sharing and samu how did you get involved in your research and with the summer research scholarship um, we also had calls uh, for the application period when um, you apply like in at the end of the year in December so that you can start working on looking for a project that are projects that are available uh, or if they are not uh, projects that you're interested in that are available then you have to look for your own supervisor so um, I just uh, after I got the scholarship or the position I started emailing my teachers uh, on areas that I was interested in. And then one of them um, decided to take me on as a student. So I used uh, research opportunity as well as an internship because in my program, you are allowed to have um, an internship or you can do elective courses. So I used my, my, my research uh, opportunity as well as an internship. And I'm continuing to work with my supervisor at the moment with my thesis. And we're also writing a paper that will present at a conference uh, in May. Wow, that's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. What was the, the topic of your research, if we can ask? OK, so uh, I'm looking at register-based research. So we are looking at disabilities, uh, specifically myelomeningocil. So my research looks, the, the first research project I did last summer looked at how uh, parents of children with disabilities are at an increased risk of um, divorce. And with our study, we found that uh, in the Swedish population, those parents were not at risk of divorce. And now currently with my thesis, I'm working with the same data set, but asking different questions. And I'm now looking at if women who have uh, myelomeningocil are at um, are receiving less uh, contraceptives if and when they need them. So yeah. Wow, very interesting and very important work. Thank you for sharing. 
And Adarsh, how about you? You've been involved in a lot of different things, but perhaps you can share a bit about how you kind of found those and why you decided to explore those options. Um, yeah, my, the first internship that I did in Prague was really something I looked up online uh, because it was my, that was my first year in bachelor's and I had three full months of summer and I wanted to do something. And I basically found the thing that was most interesting to me at the time. And honestly, I chose that because I, I, could, I got to live in Prague for a month. That's a beautiful city. And uh, the- Not uh, a bad reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and cheap beer. And uh, yeah, but uh, the, the EOS cares, I just went around uh, talking to a lot of people. I went to a lot of language cafes myself. Uh, I, I'm part of a lot of international groups in Malmö and uh, you get you sort of network when you kind of socialize and one thing leads to the other and I've got this internship where uh, they liked what I, what I have to offer and they kind of put me in charge of the language cafe and through the language cafe I met another Canadian woman who was then new in Sweden and she, uh, she said she was going to get a job at Lund International School and said I could try and that's how that led. Uh, it led me, the, uh, that's how I got to, I, that was my way to the school and yeah that's basically it. Uh, I also worked at EOS uh, uh, as a caretaker in the basketball club for almost two years. So, and that was because uh, I can speak Swedish and that was just uh, opportunistic, you know, uh, it just came along. I didn't really expect it, but yeah, it did, it did help me pay my bills. Always helpful as well. Thanks so much. And Judith, uh, I think you had some internet troubles there for a moment, but we were just talking about kind of how you found the opportunity or so how you decided to go to Costa Rica and maybe how you decided on the research that you're doing there. Uh, yeah, sorry for that. Um, no worries. But yeah, so how I found the opportunity. So as part of my program during our last semester, we have the opportunity to either do field work or uh, an internship, or in my case, it's called an innovative practice, which is sort of like an in-between. It's field work, but through a more formal uh, exchange agreement that uh, the program has with uh, the university, or well, Nat Universidad Nacional in Costa Rica. So um, yeah, that really made it easier to not have to go through the entire hassle of actually having to find uh, the institution. Um, which is really nice because we've also been able to uh, meet uh, people at the university here and learn about uh, the projects they're working on. And how I chose my topic, so I'm currently doing uh, research on the um, well, sustainability transition, but from a social uh, justice perspective in the blue economy. So it's everything that is related to um, the um, economy of oceans and uh, marine resources and how I chose this topic um, it's based on well yeah I was just looking at the context of the country that I was exploring and also what I'm passionate about so um, Costa Rica which happens to have 10 more times of um, marine land compared to terrestrial land um, seemed like a pretty good uh, case to explore. That's really interesting and really great to, to showcase there how you kind of can combine the opportunities that come along with your own interests and, and kind of figure out what's the best option for you based on where you want to go with your career. So that's awesome. Great. Um, well, I guess I'd like to go around also. I'm really curious to hear from all of you what you've learned so far through the different opportunities that you've been a part of and, and how you feel that has kind of added to your experience while, you, while you've been studying uh, in different ways. Um, so maybe we'll go the opposite way again. So we'll start back off with Adarsh and go around. Um, yeah, one of the things I learned is it's, it's very uh, useful to be a part of uh, social groups uh, and that you never know where it could lead. And that's something I would absolutely encourage everybody to do. You know, if you're new in town and you want to uh, step outside and have uh, experience some kind of social life, it's nice if you do that outside a student circle or a student context because you never know where it's going to lead. You might end up, you know, having having a drink with your future boss in, or somebody else or a future colleague. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing I, I think I really learned is it's uh, from my experience that it's given an, uh, a window into how uh, Swedish work life works, uh, both blue collar and white collar, and also how the international uh, job market is kind of different from the Swedish job market in that it's more flexible and more sort of open, if I dare say. 
uh, because it's kind of hard to get your foot in into the Swedish job market, even if you are a, a, a fluent Swedish speaker for, for many, many reasons. So it, it helps you, it has helped me sort of navigate my path better. And I sort of know what to do and what not to do once I finish my degree. And, you know, so I don't make the, I don't make the beginner's mistakes like some people would do if they wouldn't, you know, have this experience with them. Absolutely. That's all great points to make that uh, you're really testing out the Swedish market in these ways when you're taking part of these experiences. Great. And Samu, how about you? How do you think uh, taking part in your research has really added to your studies here? Um, it's been great, actually, because uh, when the, the project that I was I'm still working on uh, requires a lot of, of statistical programming and things like that. And uh, before that, I wasn't really strong in that particular field. And as time goes on, things are becoming easier and more fun to do. So the, the, the internship really helped with that as well as like, um, I have a very good supervisor. So he's always encouraging me to do and try out things. Like in, for instance, the, the conference that we will I'll present on, it was the one who was like, are you still interested in basically showing what you did during the summer? Uh, and we applied and um, it was, um, it, it's, it's going well. Uh, it's a lot of work, but um, it's something that will look good on a CV that uh, also because sometimes when you work during the summer it's something that starts and ends uh, because you only have like 10 weeks to do the project but with the way I've been working with my supervisor it's something now that is more long term uh, we've been, I've been working with him since the summer until now so um, keeping those connections is something that is good. Of course, you have to uh, have one instance of forgetting to unmute yourself in every webinar. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Samu. And Dion, how about you? Uh, how do you think having your exchange semester has impacted your studies? Of course, coming to Sweden in the first place was studying abroad, but you chose to study abroad twice. Yeah, of course, it's so exciting. And of course, you will meet a lot of new friends in Sweden and also in the Netherlands, and then you will get a lot of uh, perfect perspective, like from different uh, knowledge perspective and also culture. And it uh, give me like a new a skill to adapt in a new place. And it's also give me uh, the opportunity to meet a lot of a lot of people and it's expand my network, of course. And it's added value to your, to your CV, of course. Wonderful, thank you. And Hasni, how about you? How have all of your different experiences added to your studies? Uh, like I believe lectures and other educational components at university can be a small part of your journey. Uh, it's always better to look other opportunities that university offers, that city offers, region offers, especially if you study social sciences and want to do something outside academia. Uh, so I also had some work experiences back in Turkey, and but in Turkey we were generally using rule of thumb and, and verbal agreements, and but here I faced uh, completely a different uh, working. Uh, strategy. Every little little detail is being planned. I'm still trying to get used to it, but it also helped me with my studies. Like it helped me even in my personal life to be more organized and pay attention in small details. And when I started this program, I had completely different ideas about what I want to do in the future or for my thesis. But now all I can say have changed and planning to, for instance, look at potential use of AI to go beyond conventional arts and cultural production processes or its potential contribution to languages at risk or something about digital event organization. So I take what I learned from my practical experiences uh, into my study and I try to combine them. So it was really useful. They are still useful. Great, that's excellent to hear and really great advice as well about really taking advantage of all those opportunities that come along. Wonderful. And Judith, finally, back to you. 
So how would you say, I know you're in the middle of your research and your time in Costa Rica now, but so far, how has it been adding to your experience? Yeah, it's been really great. And for me, uh, the biggest learning so far has been to actually um, look at things from a different perspective. It's really easy to have our Eurocentric vision, as for, especially for European citizens to study in Europe. Um, and we, yeah, I think like when you're on the field and you actually are able to see um, the experience and yeah, different conditions that happen, then you start questioning some of the assumptions that you maybe had and like some biases that we're not even conscious we have, but it's, uh, so yeah, it's really uh, broadened my perspective even more. That's a great point as well. We talk a lot about kind of the, the ways that this is useful for you as a career, but I think those uh, kind of soft skills and different perspectives that you can learn from these experiences are also something that is both valuable for a career, but also just for yourself and uh, for broadening yourself. So awesome. Well, I can see we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to try and go through some of these now. Again, uh, if anyone has any questions specific to our panelists about some of the experiences they've talked about today, please feel free to post those. Um, one thing I can see we have both a, a lot of questions that are not really relevant to our topic here today. So I know that Tim is going through and answering some of those, but I just want to reiterate that we're going to try and focus today on the questions uh, relevant for our panelists, since we want to take advantage of the time that we have. But something I see we have a lot of questions about uh, in general, it phrased in a lot of different ways, but perhaps we can take this all as one big topic, is about whether or not you needed to know Swedish to take part in your different internships or experiences. Uh, and I guess in general, whether you you feel that knowing Swedish was really a requirement or something that hindered you in this uh, in this search for your experiences or not. Um, so maybe I guess we'll take these uh, more for the three of you that are working on sort of things within Sweden because uh, Dion and Judith are doing exchange. Of course, you don't need to uh, know Swedish to go on exchange. Um, but maybe Hasni, we'll start with you. Um, so how has it been? Do you know any Swedish or has Swedish been something that has impaired you in your search for these opportunities? Hey, uh, when I first arrived in Sweden, I started to learn it. And I started a course, uh, uh, but later I stopped it because it was hard for me to handle education, job, uh, volunteering, and also while I was trying to improve my English skills. Uh, so I stopped it. But al always knowing Swedish is a plus, but like in my case, I found that there are several opportunities that you can uh, get, get them without knowing Swedish. And it was one of the reasons that I stopped learning Swedish because there's also an international market here that you can chase and find uh, several uh, ways to have a place in it. Definitely, thank you for sharing. I'm also uh, going to post here in the chat, just for anyone who is interested, uh, a link where you can also maybe after the event, learn a little bit more about the options that are available for you for learning Swedish in terms of classes and things. Um, but yes, as, uh, as Hasni mentioned, you can also choose to look for things that are, are not requiring Swedish. Uh, Samu, for you, how did it work within your research uh, as far as needing to know Swedish or not, especially since you worked with Swedish populations within your research? Um, I really, I didn't need to know a lot of Swedish, but uh, as you said, my data is Swedish based, so it would come in Swedish. Um, but um, my supervisor, we the data that we use, we have a handbook where you can find um, the variables that you'll be using, and then you can usually just translate that to something that you know. But basically, um, knowing a little bit of Swedish helps because uh, then you don't have to ask every second question that what does this variable mean and things like that. But it's, it's not a big uh, a deal at, the, at, the, at this particular juncture of my research career. Uh, but um, for, if, for instance, if I then decide to do uh, qualitative research with subjects, then um, it will be with participants, sorry, with participants, then it will be necessary for me to be able to speak Swedish to my participants if I do research with, with participants. Okay, great. And Adarsh, I think you're the one here today who does know some Swedish because you've been in Swedish for quite a bit longer than the rest of our students. So maybe you can share about the other perspective about uh, after you learned Swedish, if that opened up a lot more opportunities for you. Um. 
Right. Not not necessarily because the things I have done, except work at the basketball club, that was the one big thing that I that I could only do because I could speak Swedish, and uh, because other than that, uh, working at the and working at the, the the language cafe where I could actually help others learn Swedish and manage it was just a plus. Um, I could have done without it as well because there's also a language cafe where people could speak or practice English, for instance. But yeah, knowing Swedish helps, uh, even if not directly with the job, it, uh, you, you know, it helps you uh, come across as a more viable candidate, you know, because when an employer looks at you or gives you, wants to give you an internship or a job, they think that, oh, this person knows Swedish, so they intend to stay for longer or they'll put in the extra effort and, you know, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an edge. And you never know what's going to come up because you, there might be something else that that's uh, that's available and it might be for a Swedish speaker, but it might be in your field and you don't want to miss out on that. But th that being said, I would like to say that learning Swedish just to increase your employment opportunities is not really going to work because that's that's kind of a dead end. I think you should learn Swedish just for knowing the language and with it comes opportunities. Yeah, excellent points there, Adosh. I think um, there's definitely value on, on both sides and, and it makes a big difference, I think, more yourself and how much effort you put into finding these opportunities more than, uh, you know, which language do you know and things like that. Because as we have seen here today, there are a lot of opportunities available, even if you don't know Swedish. So I think it's more about your own uh, effort and, and interest in finding those, definitely. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to wade through some of the more questions, but you still have a lot of questions here. Um, Let's see, we had one, if I can find it, regarding Venture Lab that I'd like to ask Hafni that if I can scroll through and find again, I think, yes, here, uh, is uh, regarding the work at Venture Lab and if it's more related to policies uh, because it's more business focused or more general uh, for students without maybe a policy background. No, it's totally, it's, uh, completely for beginners, actually, in the innovation and entrepreneurship flag. It mostly helps students to come up with an idea and turn it into a business idea, business plan, maybe. Uh, like I said, even you can come up with no ideas and we will help you to, to, to we will try to inspire you to have an idea about something that you already have an experience or history with it, or you were maybe just thinking about, okay, this can be something, but I'm not sure how I can turn it into an idea. So again, there are coaching sessions that you can talk with uh, business experts and they will lead you through the way. So it's open for everyone and every uh, component and event is for free uh, for students of the university. Great, thank you. And let's see, I think some of the, the larger questions that seems to have a lot of upvotes are things that um, I think we've talked about a little bit already. So um, the number one question we have here is how likely is it to get a job or an internship? And if it varies based on the course you're doing. So I think I can perhaps state that in some ways it varies based on your course, because of course some courses do require an internship. So then you're obviously going to definitely get one. Um, but I think as we've, we've talked about a lot today that it really matters more your own personal kind of drive to do that and, and the effort you put into looking for one. I don't know if anybody else would have anything that you would like to add to that question. Feel free to just shout out. Um, but I would say it's more uh, up to you rather than sort of something that uh, is likely or unlikely. It depends. Uh, sorry, sorry. No, go for it. I, I would advise that the don't don't be shy, don't be afraid. People in Sweden uh, are really uh, generous, and that they are not uh, as it's, it's it's a stereotype. They are not cold. They are willing to help you and talk to you if you have something to offer or if you have something to share. And just email anything that you are interested in. Just chase as much as you can. So they will help you. They will answer you. And even if it's not uh, ends up what you want, uh, it will lead you to somewhere else. 
That's a great point as well. Thanks, Hosni. And I think leading in kind of from this question, we also have uh, others who are wondering if it's common to find resource assistance jobs or in general how common it is. So I guess something that would be interesting to ask is, of course, we have a lot of great opportunities here that you guys are showcasing. Uh, is it something that you find most of your course mates also are taking advantage of different opportunities like this? Or is it something that uh, you kind of seem to be the exception in your course of someone who's doing a research or jobs or things? Um, maybe I'll just open that up to whoever would like to answer. Um, I think it depends. Research assistance and project assistance, it depends on what is being done. So if there is requirement, they advertise it and then they recruit you. So as far as I can say from the humanities and linguistics department, they are very few. And, uh, and it very, it's very subject specific. If a certain researcher or professor wants, they open up a, they open up a position and they advertise it and uh, you get to work, but it's not many, it's not many at all, but this is only for the humanities department I can speak for. Great, yeah, research assistants in general, I would say are not quite as common in Sweden as they are in other countries. Um, just to add to that um, as well, there, I agree that they're not as common um, compared to other countries, but if they're there, uh, you have to go looking for them or put out feelers that you are interested in doing research. And if there's something that is available, then the, the professors will usually uh, say, I have something suitable for you. Would you like to be involved? And things like that. But it's all about looking uh, at the right places. But for us in the medical faculty, it's a little bit different because usually with the summer scholarship, then you know that there are certain projects that are ongoing that you can choose to, to, to take part in, especially when it comes to like web sciences. There are different labs around Lund that usually take students during um, during the summer or with part even uh, or other projects that they have going on. So if you are interested in a particular field, uh, working in an actual lab, then you will get those opportunities, but you have to look for them. Definitely some great points. And Judith, you have your hand up. Something to share? Uh, yeah, it was uh, kind of um, following up on uh, what Samuel was just saying. I feel like um, in, at least in my experience in my faculty, the classes, especially for master's students, they're not super big, so you get to know not only your uh, peers, but also your teachers. In Sweden, there's also a very um, equal uh, culture between professors and students. So you can always feel free to tell uh, your professors you're interested in. And even if there is not a uh, student research opportunity there, if they know that you have interest, they might actually consider uh, have uh, something or they can recommend you to other projects. So I think uh, you can be proactive about it. Definitely. And kind of on the same topic a little bit as far as searching and kind of how you can kind of use your own methods to look for those options. We have a question here of someone who asked if those of you who did internships or maybe even, I guess, part-time jobs uh, used any particular search engine when you were looking uh, for your opportunities around Sweden or in the EU, or I know we've heard a little bit from some of you about how, how you found those, but has anybody used any, any search engines or other kind of databases to find opportunities? Actually, I used, but they didn't work. Like <laughs> <laughs> applying to job ads online that you saw on search engines at the beginning don't work. Uh, but the what works is the human engines that you have around you. Uh, and the Facebook is, or LinkedIn, just, just basic ones, uh, mostly leads your way uh, to an opportunity. Definitely, I like that the human engines is, is uh, what works. I'm going to start using that. Great. Let's see. Now, again, remember, we have about half an hour left. So if anybody has any other questions uh, for our panelists about the opportunities they've talked about, please feel free to jump into the chat. I'm trying to bounce around a little bit and get uh, some examples. I think we have a few questions here also related to how the university specifically helps you in collaborations, either within degree projects or finding internships. So maybe for those of you, especially where uh, a degree project or internship was required for your program, uh, what was the support like from the university or maybe more specifically from your department in terms of helping you find that or giving you direction on what you were supposed to do there? 
Um, so maybe Judith, you you're doing something that's kind of part of your studies, correct? So maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, for sure. So in my case, I got quite a lot of support because, as I said, it's a uh, sort of like an agreement. Uh, but at the same time, um, you still have to um, manage, like, look for your own accommodation, make your travel arrangements. Um, but we did get help with some funding as well as um, Lund University provides a really nice uh, insurance. Uh, but there's also within my program, there's also the option to go to go do field work that you organize all on your own. Uh, but still, I feel like most professors are quite happy to help you uh, with uh, connections if they might have to, if they happen to have anything in the country or destination you're interested in. Um, Definitely. I think I, it's safe to say that's uh, quite a good resource across the board is kind of taking advantage of your professors and asking them kind of the connections they have as well. Um, because often there's, especially in programs that have an internship requirement, uh, for example, I didn't mention in the beginning, but I'm actually an alumni of Lund. I studied the Master's in Applied Cultural Analysis, which is a program that does have a required work placement as part of the program. So I know for our department, for example, there were very, uh, a lot of companies that had had internships or work placements before. Um, uh, from students so they kind of were familiar with the idea and already had made that connection had already seen the value in having Lund students work for them so it was always really common to be able to kind of get those names and things uh, from the program to kind of start off your search definitely um, but does anybody else have anything to add there as far as um, support systems that were available for you in your search from the university's perspective I think we've talked a little bit uh, with Samu about kind of finding out about the, the research scholarship and things through the university. And yeah. Uh, yeah, in my program, uh, the, the program provide the panel, like uh, several companies come to our uh, class and then tell the opportunity about the internship so we can apply uh, the internship there, but it's only a limited number of the opportunities so but uh, the rest of the class should find themselves to find the internship opportunity yeah i'd say that's quite common that there's like some some kind of suggestions but it usually is a bit up to you which at the same time i think in is very realistic in terms of after you graduate there are usually support systems. We do have a, a career and alumni office that can help you kind of point in the right direction of jobs. But in the end, it is always up to you when searching for a job. So it's good practice to know that you've done that before while looking for an internship or, or similar. Judith, you unmuted. So did you have something to add? Yeah, I also wanted to add that I know that at least the uh, uh, faculty of um, the School of Management and Business uh, and Economics uh, are the same. We have a sort of like a internships portal so some companies uh, share opportunities on that portal and then that's um, that are directly relevant to uh, economics and business students uh, so you kind of get the filter and you know that they're actually interested in um, yeah doing internship with students so I'm guessing that most faculties will have something similar yeah definitely Another question we have, or well, actually two questions here, but I'll start with the first, um, is a, a student who's asking, what do you think are the reasons for experiencing that it's harder to get into the Swedish job market compared to other international job markets? So Adarsh, I think that's something maybe uh, that you mentioned earlier about uh, that the Sweden can be a bit difficult to jump into the job market compared to others. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a bit, there is a bit of a bias in the Swedish market um, they don't look at, uh, they, they do look at if you are a native Swede, an ethnic Swede, and uh, it's, you are sort of sidelined. And this is not just me, but my experience with friends who are born and raised in Sweden who are not white ethnic Swedes have also told me that this is an experience they share. So there is that bias in the system. And it's not something we can do anything about. Uh, in the international market, however, that, that bias does not seem to exist. As I have noticed, people who've studied masters for two years and gone on to get jobs in their fields without knowing a word of Swedish. So that's not, uh, and these are in, in fields like finance, economics, tech, uh, interaction design, stuff like that. So uh, I would say that bias doesn't exist in the international market. It definitely does in the Swedish one. 
Great, and I think that's uh, also a good reason to really expand how you're looking uh, and what different careers you're looking into while you're here in Sweden and try to take a look at what those international companies are out there as they can be a bit more, uh, uh, have more opportunities for you, especially if you don't speak Swedish. One thing I would like to add there as well um, from my experience and also from just experience in general in Sweden is that uh, Sweden even more than most countries, I think, really relies on networking as a really big uh, effort in the job market. I know that's something that everywhere in the world people talk about the importance of networking, but in Sweden, actually, only a fraction of the jobs that are available even get advertised because quite often uh, companies already kind of have met someone in mind or someone passes along a name of someone that they think would be good for a job and they decide to interview that person and go with them. So I think more than even in most countries, the main uh, the name of the game is to kind of use your opportunity here at Lund to be making those connections and things. I know a lot of students who have had jobs even invented for them at a company because they did an internship or they volunteered with the company. The company liked them and decided to create a job for them that wasn't even a job that would have been advertised normally. So I really think we've talked about that a lot here today, but uh, really taking advantage of that network is the, the biggest thing that you can do in terms of getting ahead in the Swedish job market. And Judith, you have something to add there? Yeah, and on that, there's also um, a lot of sort of career fairs that are organized by student unions, but also uh, other student associations. So um, yeah, that might be specific for um, your faculty or your um, project, uh, sorry, uh, program. So that those are opportunities also to actually network with uh, companies or other institutions, which um, the last couple of years have been uh, virtual, but I think now everything is slowly but surely coming back to um, being on campus as well, which is nice. Definitely. And Adarsh? Yeah, uh, adding to that, there are a lot of uh, education job fairs that happen in Lund. I think there are several conducted by Ideon themselves, and they, it's very important that you go to these, and that's where you build contacts. You might just find yourself in an you know, internship or an employer, you know, and uh, even if you don't, you, you'll meet someone who, who knows someone and who knows someone, you know, it's always like, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. So you go to those fairs with your, with your CV and you hand them out and you never know who's going to call you back, even if it is for an unpaid internship, but that still has the potential to lead you somewhere else. And, you know, it, it's, it's lots of these happen in Malmö as well. So it's important to not limit yourself just to Lund and Malmö is an even bigger city, like you said in your presentation. Absolutely. Great point there. I mean, it's really important to take advantage of the whole uh, environment that we have here. Sorry, the whole area um, of Malmö, Copenhagen, even going up to uh, Helsingborg, which is where Hausney studies. Helsingborg is one of the fastest growing cities in Sweden in terms of different industries and things. So really take advantage of kind of the whole area that you have here. And Hausney? Yeah, uh, I will like to add something about what Adar said. Probably there's a bias in the market that I haven't experienced yet. But I also know people who work, for instance, in municipalities and like Swedish logistic firms, uh, who knows a broken Swedish actually, and they, they, they got the job, even they are international students. So it's also uh, a fact uh, beyond the uh, bias that you keep in mind and don't like block the Swedish market in your mind and don't, don't say, no, I won't get a job there. Just try it. Even I have a friend who got a job after applying like hundreds, after sending hundreds of applications after a year. So even if it takes a long time, it's still a chance. Absolutely, great point there. And I think uh, personally, my recommendation to students always is even if you uh, don't have time and it's completely understandable not to have time to learn Swedish fluently. And in some ways, I think that's unrealistic while you're also studying a full-time degree program. Um, it can be useful just to learn what I call coffee room Swedish, which is enough to be able to say, hey, how's your day? The weather's nice, you know, um, nice coffee, see you later. Uh, because I think a lot of companies just wanna know that that essentially they won't need to switch to you in English every single time they pass you in the hallway just to say hello. But if you know enough Swedish to kind of be polite, your work might always be in English, but it's just kind of nice to be able to have that little bit of conversational Swedish to fit into the work environment sometimes. Definitely. 
And we have a we had a question here. Here, let me find it again. Here we go um, from a student about uh, study abroad. So perhaps this is uh, one for Dion and Judith um, about if study abroad opportunities that were available for you were only during the semester, or was there also an option that you could have gone abroad during the summer if you chose? I don't know. I think this really is going to vary depending on your program, of course. Um, but perhaps just from your perspectives, what options there were? Uh Okay, I will start uh, for my program. It's only two options. It's during the autumn period or the spring period, but there's a lot, not a lot, several uh, opportunity. Also, it's summer course. It's several with the, it's different with the exchange program, but it's also quite a good opportunity to go abroad, but it's uh, maybe only six weeks or four weeks to get uh, to get the summer course it's like from the different university abroad as well yeah great thank you and judith for you did you have the option if you'd wanted to go in the summer or was it mostly during the semesters um in my program uh, there's also uh, sort of like um an exchange opportunity where you do courses uh, and that's happening on the fall of your second year. And then if you want to do field work or the type of research uh, exchange that I'm doing, it has to be in the spring semester of the second year. So you don't have that flexibility. It's based on the program structure. Definitely. And I think, as I mentioned, that will vary a lot depending on the program. Samo, I'm curious for the uh, summer research scholarship, which of course, as the name implies, <laughs> needs to be done during the summer. Is that something that if you had chosen, could you have done that abroad or does that research need to be within Sweden? Um, you need to find a, a supervisor within uh, the medical faculty for the summer research project. But we also have opportunities to have a study abroad semester in the in the autumn semester when you get to choose electives. So, um, but that is the only time you basically are able to go. So you, you could decide to go in the summer right up until the, the end of the autumn semester. So if you choose to go abroad, um, there is a, a timeline that you, you need to follow uh, for study abroad opportunities. Great, that makes sense. And to stay with you, Samu, we have a question specifically for uh, the Masters in Public Health, uh, which is about uh, once completing the first year class, could you go and do research in your home? And I'm guessing this is maybe for your degree project or something in the second year. So if you wanted to return home, maybe for your thesis semester, would that have been an option? Yes, that is uh, an option. I actually have a friend who is doing data collection in Kenya. So that's where she is, uh, she is at the moment writing, collecting data there. Um, so like I said, you can decide to, we, we, we have like a, a course to do at the end of the year in December. And, but basically as of January, you can then decide to travel and start your data collection and research from that point onwards. Okay, great. Uh, excellent. And as we see, Diane is uh, also doing that, uh, doing data collection in Indonesia and in her home country. So, and uh, yes. so it depends on your program, of course, but I think a lot of programs, um, I know the program that I studied as a master's student at Lund also encouraged that. So in a lot of countries, or a lot of programs, sorry, uh, even if there isn't maybe an exchange program built into your studies, you could potentially go abroad to do your research for your thesis project. Great. And we also have a question here that's maybe relevant for everyone, but I think I want to direct it specifically to Hasni because you talked uh, also about being a student mentor, uh, where uh, the student's asking what, what does that involve? Is it comparable to tutoring, for example? Kind of, yeah. It's basically uh, as uh, current students, you are responsible for some incoming students for, uh, that are admitted to a program and you are planning like, different kinds of events to welcome them in their first weeks and during the whole semester to uh, let them uh, mingle with the city and with the Sweden. So basically it's uh, to help them uh, in doing their adaptation process in Sweden. 
Definitely. And that will be something that uh, hopefully for everyone who is admitted to Lund will be able to get to know about before you even arrive, as Halsey mentioned. So while you won't be uh, volunteering until you're in Sweden, you will have the student mentors there supporting you during the summer to kind of help you in that transition process. There are also some uh, faculties who do offer part-time work as uh, more traditional kind of student uh, mentors who do provide tutoring or specific kind of uh, extra classes to help students through their studies uh, during the first year. Usually these are second year students who are helping first year students with the classes during the first year. So I don't think anyone we have here today is involved in that, but um, that is also an option that exists in a lot of different faculties that can be both a really great way, especially if you're interested in going into some sort of teaching or kind of mentoring career, but also in general is just a, a good resource for those of you in a first year uh, program to be able to learn from the advice of the older students. Definitely. Okay, let's see, we're, we're finally narrowing down some of our questions here. We have about 15 minutes left, so please keep the questions coming if anyone has anything else that you're wondering about. Um, just a couple of the questions here that we mentioned already in the uh, PowerPoint, but I'll quickly answer them just in case uh, if you joined late, perhaps you missed that part. So one student is asking about if you need a separate work permit in order to work during your studies. Uh, no, you do not. So on your study permit, all students who uh, come to Lund either as an EU or non-EU student are allowed to work legally in Sweden. Uh, it's just more about uh, finding that opportunity and also making sure that you have time on the side of your studies. Uh, but as we've seen today, we have many students here who are taking advantage of some of those opportunities. So it is possible. Um, another person who is asking if there are graduate assistant opportunities. This is also something we've talked a bit about already, but just to briefly reiterate, uh, graduate assistantships don't really exist so much at Lund the way that they do in other, uh, in, in other countries. So uh, it's not really very common to, to find an assistantship in terms of funding kind of uh, the other parts of your studies. Um, I know we also had a question here about kind of how common it is to have an internship be paid or unpaid in terms of uh, those. So maybe that's just something uh, for those of you who have done internships, if you'd like to chime in briefly about whether those internships were paid or unpaid. I think just like in most countries, it's probably most common to have unpaid, but it is possible to find paid internships. So maybe um, Hazi and Adarsh, if you'd like to jump in there. Yeah, the first one I did in Prague was unpaid, but they, they took care of my accommodation for the whole month. Wow. So, and that was nice. Uh, the, the EOS cares was also unpaid. Um, so that was what I, the first four months until I got employed by the club, it was an unpaid internship. But also it was like eight to 10 hours a week. So that wasn't really much. And eight to 10 hours uh, on the site. And other than that, uh, social media and stuff so it's pro probably maybe I would say 11 hours at most but yeah was both unpaid okay and it's it's in my experience it's very hard to find paid internships until unless you find it in like access or tetra pack definitely I think like most countries internships usually are unpaid but you can be one of the lucky few who finds a paid one uh Hasni how about you how, how have your internships been in terms of pay I haven't done an internship, but what I do now as a volunteer, it's also unpaid. Uh, like I said, I just emailed him and I wanted to be part of the project. So it's kind of a volunteer thing, but you never know. Uh, and another thing, I applied for an internship position. It was also another uh, startup entrepreneurship company in Malmo called The Mink, the Minch, the Mink. And they were offering an internship uh, unpaid. Uh, we uh, didn't make it happen because of my workload and study lot, but yeah, it was basically unpaid. But yeah, uh, if you spend enough time in, as an intern in a company and if you like build good relationships, uh, even maybe after one month, you can turn it into a paid position. Just don't block these opportunities because they are unpaid. 
That's definitely true. A good point. Uh, we have another student uh, who was meant to be in our panel today, but unfortunately she had got held up in another meeting. Um, Sarah, who has uh, done a couple internships actually in MAMA, both through Mink and through other opportunities, and uh, has found uh, a few paid internships as an innovation and out analyst and through Squana Startups. Um, so at the end of the session today, I'm going to post a link where you can actually contact all of our students here today. And Sarah, uh, if you'd like to ask about that, so you will be able to kind of ask more questions later. Um, so hopefully uh, those of you who are interested in learning more about uh, sort of working in different startups and maybe finding some paid internships can jump over and chat with Sarah later. Um, we have a question here that's maybe not necessarily about uh, practical experience, but I think it's still a good question uh, for students. So I'm going to ask, um, we have a student who says they live in Sweden and have applied to a master's, but they're not used to writing texts in English and is wondering if you found it very hard to study in English or if you kind of get used to it, um, is that's their biggest concern. So maybe this is a step away a little bit, but I think it's also something that a lot of people have concerns about. So I want to ask. So maybe I'll open that up uh, to anyone, because I think most everyone uh, is not uh, necessarily a native English speaker coming in. So maybe you had the same concern. What's your experience been like? The programs would specify your level of English that's required to study. Usually. Yes, uh, that's, even that's... though, sorry, even though it's conducted in English, there is a certain level of English that you need to have. So they would say, you know, United Kingdom, United States, high school level, otherwise, some, uh, IELTS score or something like that. Yes, definitely. So that's a good point that uh, for applying to any program here at Lund, there is a required level of English that you need to, to show either through previous studies or through a English test. Um, but I know there can still be some nervousness about even if you kind of test into that level, even if you if you haven't really written academic papers before in English, that could be kind of a, a different concern. So uh, Hasni, you have something to share about that? Yes, uh, again, I would say don't be afraid of it, uh, because the programs generally are guide you through the academic writing and academic thinking. So they don't expect you to be native speakers or be excellent in writing. They are just they just want you to have basic knowledge of English speaking and writing skills, and they guide you through the, the whole process. So don't be afraid, just being able to telling your ideas and what you think, uh, being able to transform it to others uh, would be more than enough. Great, thank you. And Judith? Uh, yeah, I also say that, um, especially for master programs, um, they're mostly international programs. so people come from all over uh, the world and like native English speakers are generally a minority. So everyone has their accent and their struggles. Uh, and I know that at least at Lucem, there's an academic skills uh, service that they will help you with um, yeah, academic writing and language uh, skills. Great. Yeah, that's another good point. There is uh, resources for you if you're not feeling quite so comfortable with English. There are academic uh, kind of workshops and things that can help you. But uh, I would agree that uh, for the most part, um, we have 60% of our master's students here at Lund are international students or are uh, students that for the vast majority are coming from non-native English uh, speaking countries. So even though uh, you're from Sweden, you will be in the same boat as far as not being maybe a native English speaker, but that uh, everyone makes it through in the end. And, and I think really that if you feel nervous in the beginning, there will be support there for you, definitely. Great, well, we're winding down to the end of our time here. So I think, um, as we wrap things up, I would really just love to hear maybe from each of you again, what's the biggest takeaway that you've had from the experiences and uh, any sort of final tips that you would give to students who are considering when they come to Lund, should they take the extra time to, to do research or do an internship or study abroad, um, whatever you have been involved in, what would kind of be your final tips and, and your biggest takeaway from that? Um, perhaps we'll go from the back up uh, with Judith. We'll start with you. Um, yeah, for sure. I'm. It's always like you have to assess what is your like time and like how you're feeling. If you're already feeling overwhelmed by 
your studies, then do not feel the pressure to have to uh, engage in other activities. But if you want to explore other opportunities out there, I think it's definitely a very enriching um, way of not only getting practical experience, but also meeting new people um, and exploring your own interests. So for sure. <laughs> Great, great advice. Adarsh, how about you? What's been your biggest takeaway and your, your top tips for students coming to Lund? Um, network as much as possible. And even if it is in a context which just which is not necessarily related to internships or unemployment, you know, like a, being part of a student group or something like that, go outside and talk to people you never know where it's going to lead. A great point. I can't uh, recommend that enough as well. Networking is the way to go in Sweden. Definitely. Samu, how about you? Um, I think if you're going to do like something like a research-based internship, you need to have clear goals about what you want to achieve at the end of it. So when I did my research uh, internship, I told my supervisor that um, I'm interested in a career in academia. So then he was, he's been helping me to get that in uh, ever since I told him. So that would have been making my way through publishing, presenting at um, conferences and things like that. So you need to be really clear about what you want to learn during the internship period. I, I guess it works as well as the internships in industry um, that you need to be very clear about this is what I want to get through and this is what I want to gain at the end of the experience. Definitely, also really great advice there. Thank you for sharing. Dion, what's been your biggest takeaway from your exchange and your research and big tips? Um, Okay, well, the international opportunities and exposure always uh, become the advantage for us, especially for networking and also we can gain a lot of perspective and knowledge from a lot of uh, different people around the world. And I would say, uh, find your passion and find, define what you want to do and uh, choose the, the lot of international opportunities that switch you. It's so exciting. Definitely, thank you. And Hasni, we'll leave off with you. What are your top tips and takeaways? Hi, my friend said, if you have a clear goal, for instance, being an academician or going with research, like focus on the university and the, the department and try to uh, make, create bonds with your professors or doctoral students, but if you are someone like me who has a wide range of interests, I will say chase, like chase like a little cute dog who are going after everything and make him or her happy. So especially for your first year, that's what I am doing. Try different opportunities because there are tons of opportunities here around Sweet, uh, Skåne and try to like let yourself be inspired by others and don't get afraid to contact people email them write them go and talk to them uh, even if you are at the beginning of your uh, study so like i said even if you don't get exactly what you want be kind and stay in touch with people probably maybe you can uh, get something out of it during next semester or, or during end of your Wonderful. Excellent advice all around. And it's been so interesting to hear from all of you today about your different experiences and so valuable, hopefully, to our students in the audience. So I want to thank our panel so much uh, for being here for today and for sharing your experiences here at Lund. I also want to thank my colleague Tim in the chat, who has been answering a lot of questions as well. So thank you for that support, Tim. And before I leave you all, I want to just draw your attention to a few links that I've posted in the chat that can maybe be helpful for you uh, in the future. So the first is uh, a link where you can contact our staff. So if you have any other questions, especially about your application or things like that, this is where you can get in contact with us uh, to ask those questions. Then the second link is the link to our Unibuddy, which is where you can chat to over 100 different current students and alumni, including all five of our students here today, and also including Sarah, our student who unfortunately wasn't able to make it with us today. But if you want to hear more about her experiences as well, um, please jump over and chat with any of our students at any time. 
Then finally, I've given you a link to more information about jobs and internships uh, and finding work after your studies. You can read a little bit more about that on our website. And then lastly, I just want to remind you that uh, this has been the first of several different events that we have this month as part of our Student Life Month. So please uh, check out that link to see some of the other upcoming events that we have where you'll get to hear from our different student nations, unions, and associations, as well as different student services, such as the academic support that we've talked about today, uh, the LU Accommodation Office, uh, International Office, Alumni and Career Services, a lot of different services. So definitely join our other events there, but at the same time uh, on Facebook and Instagram, we're having coverage all month from those different organizations to highlight those opportunities that you have. So if you have more questions about student life and about getting involved, hopefully you can join us throughout the month and get those questions answered. But with that, I will wish you all a good day and thank Thank you again to our panelists and thank you to our audience who's given us so many fantastic questions today. We wish you a great rest of the day.